Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. It's great to uh, see all of you here today and welcome uh, our campuses. Uh, how many guys uh, recited the Lord's Prayer uh, at least twice last week? Oh, yes. All right. Um, so that was good. That's, uh, we'll, we'll take that. Um, I, I tried to do it three times. I missed uh, a few uh, a few weeks, we've had lots of conversations about how difficult uh, the afternoon uh, prayer is because it's often in the way of what we're doing. Uh, and that's actually what we're going to be talking about um, this morning. And I want to talk about uh, something that is really difficult for us to understand when it comes to prayer and praying and all this. And that is, how does God answer our prayers? How does he answer our prayers? So I want to walk you through uh, one of the most pointed scenes, I think, in all the scriptures, um, where there is a cosmic wrestling and a place where Jesus prays in direct opposition to what the Father wills. And talk about how it is that we ask and sort of the relationship to answers. So I, I want to be very, uh, very careful uh, in how I couch this today. But I want us to pull sort of back away from this. I want to be careful because I, I do not want to in any way suggest that God does not hear our requests, that he does not answer our prayers because I believe that he does in a very direct way. I believe that he does. I have personally experienced this uh, in a number of ways. And in fact, I'll go ahead and take a, a, a risk by asking how many of you guys have done this. That, uh, and I know this is true because I've had conversations with people even last week. But you have prayed for something very specifically for God to do. And it, it felt kind of trivial. And he did it. And then when it happened, you just sort of wrote it off as a coincidence. Has anybody had that happen? You felt that? And you, you try to figure out, okay, God, are you really doing this? Or is this my imagination? Or am I seeing this? Or am I reading into something? I've seen that happen with very trivial things. I've seen it happen with very substantial things. Um, you know, I've done this for a long time. Uh, a lot of my posture in learning how to be a pastor uh, is experimenting in a lot of ways because people ask you to do things that I've never done before. Uh, and so you go and say, hey, Mike, can you bless this or pray for this or uh, ask for healing for this. I'm like, sure, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll try to, I want to be discerning. I want to be measured. I want to ask correctly. And I want to ask in a way uh, that honors both the person who is requesting prayer. And I want to honor what God intends um, uh, to do. And so there's always a tension when we talk about asking and answering uh, prayers. And a lot of us have heard that when we ask for things, God has three answers. Perhaps you've heard this. That God says no, he says yes, or he says not yet. Y'all have heard this before, perhaps? Now, I agree with that. I don't, I don't disagree with that. I, I just think that perhaps it's a little bit um, limited in the way we think about God answering our prayers and what it is that he actually wants to do in our lives and what I think also happens is that this leaves a lot of people, perhaps you, really shaken in your faith and hesitant in your prayers. Because perhaps you did pray for something and God did not answer it the way that you wanted him to, that you thought he would or even that you thought he should. And so there are no's and not yet's that have left you disappointed with God or perhaps disappointed with yourself. 
thinking that perhaps you aren't praying right or if you just had more faith, then God would have done something like you're trying to pry something out of his hands. And you know people who have felt like that or perhaps that is your experience um, as well. And I think what, what happens to us is we sort of fall into this trap of just trying to convince ourselves that we really don't doubt the way that we actually do. And we just end up pretending until our faith collapses. So you, you ask God for things and you ask him in ways sometimes that feels like there's no way this is gonna happen. And then you feel guilty that you doubt that God could do what you're asking him to do. And then you resolve that if he just had enough faith, he would have done it. But because you didn't have enough faith, he didn't do it. And so we get stuck in these loops and prayer feels futile. And sometimes it feels like a crapshoot, like we're just hoping this works. Or maybe we feels like if we put more money in the plate or we're more obedient or promised to, to do better at what we have struggled to do well, then perhaps he would hear us a little bit more clearly. And what I think is it's not whether or not you're good or bad at prayer. Um, most everybody I know when you ask people, I say, how is your prayer life? They'll almost always scale their prayer lives in sort of, a, I don't do it enough, I don't do it correctly enough, I don't do it as much as I should or whatever it is. And I just want us to put all that away from us for a little while and just try to get a better vision for what prayer looks like. Something that happens to us when we ask, when we ask God, when I ask God for things, I wanna be very clear, I'm asking God for things according to what I see, to what I can see. I'm often asking God things according to my own will and my own way and my own preference. And then I end up looking for answers according to what I already expect or what I expect him to do. I have some kind of expectation, expectation of how he's gonna, an you get that, right? Of how he's gonna answer us. And so we set ourselves out looking for those things. And I've done this long enough. Again, I wanna be really clear. I've had incredibly miraculous prayers answered. There are some places where I have prayed with diligence for a decade or more. There are other places where I have sworn that I was gonna pray with persistence and then forgotten about it in two weeks. And I remember it eight years later. So I've had all those experiences. You know, I joke that I pray with a pen uh, not because I'm more spiritual than people, because I have significant attention problems. Uh, when I would close my eyes to pray, it would go something like this, God, I'm really serious about praying. As soon as I get on my knees, I'm really serious about praying. I close my eyes. I'm like, God, I just want you to meet me here. And I'm like, my eyes are closed and I see blue. And blue reminds me of the ocean. I wonder what the waves are doing. Let me get up and check, right? You ever have that happen? You're like, you're serious about prayer. And then like four seconds in, you're like, in La La Land. And then what do you feel like? You feel like a terrible Christian and terrible faith and all those things. So I've learned the importance of discipline in my prayers. And I think this is exactly why what God has given to us in here is designed to be used. Before we jump into that, I just want to remember as we, as we journey through this today, we're using these instructions that Jesus gave us. This is how you should pray. Um, the Lord's Prayer, I think, can serve as a powerful tool for how we learn how to pray, for us to do this. The reason I began and used these simple prayers and I use these discipline in prayers, I read prayer books, I read prayers out of the Bible, I write prayers out of the Bible, and at this current season of my life, I'm using the Lord's Prayer. The reason is because simple prayer serves as a foundation for the way in which I commune with God. It serves as a foundation for continual prayer. So I want us to recognize all the tension that goes in it. I want us to recognize all the facts that we, we all struggle to pay attention like we should. All those things are true about us. But the good news in this is that the reason that we think we shouldn't pray is precisely the reason Jesus said that we should. And this is how he introduces his prayer, that your Father in heaven already knows what you need before you even ask. This is incredibly good news. Your father, your good father, your heavenly father, he knows. He knows. He knows what is deep. He knows where there is disappointment. He knows where there is frustration. He knows where we are afraid. He knows where we are ashamed. He knows. And so he invites us 
to come. Again, I do not want for us at the end of this series to be able to just recite the Lord's Prayer really, really quickly and cleverly and precisely. But rather, I want for there to be a richness, a richness and a foundation underneath the way you continually pray, the way you breath prayer, the way you commune with God throughout your day. I want there to be a foundation there. And this is exactly how this is printed uh, or, or presented to us. Uh, the second thing I want to mention, so simple prayer proceeds uh, or serves as a foundation for continual prayer. And my conviction is that we will only learn to pray sometime or anytime, anywhere when we first learn to pray sometime, somewhere. And this is why I have invited you to carve out a space. It takes about three and a half minutes and recite the Lord's Prayer in a daily sort of disciplined fashion because this will serve as a foundation for where we're going. So that's where we are. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can look in Luke chapter 22. Uh, this story is recorded in Matthew and Mark and also Luke. And uh, so we'll be looking at Luke's uh, account of that uh, today. So I want for us to consider just for a little bit, something a little bit more than just the answers to our prayers, just, just for today. We're going to sort of see what God uh, is inviting us or asking of us, and perhaps we'll see his answers in ways that maybe you didn't uh, expect. Uh, in Ephesians, we looked at this last week, that Paul reminds us that we are to pray at all times in the Spirit, and then he connects it to being alert, or some versions say sober-minded. Uh, other places, it's described sort of as, as a, a keen awareness for what is happening in our world, and more importantly, a keen awareness of what the Holy Spirit is doing, of what God himself is doing. How does the way of the kingdom occur here and now in your world where you live, in the real life, where you have bills to pay and obligations and pressures and all those things? And what I want for us to understand is that, that our prayers, your prayers, the way we pray, is not just about um, getting God to do something for us or to answer our requests, but it's about joining him. It's about participating with him. It's about seeing and sensing and having a perspective. This is why the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is introduced with our Father in heaven, how would be our name. The first posture is to get his perspective. This is really hard for us to do. And it comes at a really high price. When we think about praying to God or asking God, offering our request often feels like you're uh, sort of submitting a purchase order or you're you know, kind of asking permission for a sleepover. You're like, hey, let's see how mom and dad are doing. What's happening? Let's get a lay of the land. Hey, mom. And if she's like really snippy, you just go ask dad, right? Hey, dad, can so-and-so spend the night? You're trying to get a feel. And what you're waiting on is approval or denied, right? It's like some kind of thing. So we've asked God these things. We're sort of waiting on his answer to be yes, no, or not yet, or some version of that. And a lot of us think of our, our prayers like this, and this is sort of what we're looking for and asking for and wondering about. And I think there's a different way for us to consider this. It's actually more prevalent and more um, available, more clear than what we, what we think. One of the things that we talk about around Port City is we use some of these statements and how we try to measure and understand discipleship. And there are these core statements. And one of the, the foundational statements is that God is great, God is good, and God is near. God is great, God is good, and God is near. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. God is great, God is good, God is near. This passage Paul is writing in Philippians from, from prison. And he's in a lot of hardship and he's in pain for what is happening. There were a lot of things that have not worked out, perhaps, the way that he thought they would be used. He's never rattled. And here's his letter to the followers of Jesus in the early church. And he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, we looked at this last week, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And we stop. 
present your request to God. So we ask him and we ask for him to do what? To answer us. Present your request to God. The instruction we get is a little different. Present your request to God and look what it says. And the peace of God, which transcends our understanding, will do what? Will serve to protect and to guard the inner place. It'll serve to do and preserve something inside of us. And we begin to see that something has to happen in what we expect and what we see and what we want. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy, what's next? Will be done, right. Our requests, and I could tell you very personal stories very personal stories about walking into circumstances where there's been a diagnosis that is terminal and sitting and having a conversation, how do you want to pray? How do you want to pray? How are we sensing God leading us to pray? Because what we all want is obvious in every time. It's healing and it's this to go away and all these things. And we know that that's just not how the world how we operate in the world. And what God tells us is the same. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious, but in everything, bring everything to him. And it's in that place when we offer all of us, we bring every request and every desire that we have and everything that we would will, we bring it to him. And we are met with a peace, with something inside of us that isn't calculatable by our logic. There's something else that we're invited to see. We're met with his presence and the promise of his peace and his protection that he will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. I've learned that prayer is something far more pervasive in my own life than just making a request. And I do make them. I pray for all kinds of things, heavy things, ridiculous things. I pray for waves. Okay, I I do that. I have a very limited window uh, when I have to go uh, surf. God, can you just let the wind die down? And sometimes it does, and you go, is that a coincidence? Who knows? I don't know. But what I've learned is I've learned how to sense him. I've learned to commune with him. I've learned his strength to endure when I want to quit. I've learned his faithfulness in places where I have failed him. I have learned his grace in sin struggles that I thought would undo me. I have learned his his victory over things that I thought I would never get beyond. I have also learned his grace when he says, I'm not gonna remove that thorn. This is gonna be with you for a while. All those things I've learned in prayers. A lot of us have this idea that when God answers prayer, we're gonna experience this utopian existence. It's not what on earth as it is in heaven means. But that's what our wills tend to look like. It's just the perspective we have and that's part of it. I think God understands that he already knows. This is the picture we're trying to get to. So real quick, here's a couple of things that I just wanna give you by way of observation and you can take a picture of this or write this down. But prayer... What I've learned is prayer is the reality that I have access to God. And I've squandered that access. I know for a long time I was very, very disciplined in learning how to develop and pray. It was a discipline. I would go to a coffee shop and I would sit down and I would um, sit down to pray. And, you know, you have all the wonky stuff that happens in your head. And I would just sort of suddenly reach under the table and I would slide a chair out and I would try in my mind to imagine that Jesus is sitting with me in the coffee shop. When someone walks up and grabs a chair, I'm like, oh, Jesus is sitting there. They usually don't talk to you anymore. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I tried to imagine this because I needed, I needed a way to see and to think and to consider that I have access to the God of all all creation. It's a sobering thing. Our Father in heaven, this is absolutely incredible. 
So it is about access that, that, that we easily take for granted. Me personally, um, I try not to ever use the phrase big man upstairs. I don't mean any offense to people who do that. I just have tried to discipline myself so there's a little bit more. I, I need more reverence because I tend to be very casual. Number two, prayer is the way in which we experience his presence. And there is no shortcut to this. There just is no shortcut. It never doesn't feel like a waste of time when you feel a lot of pressure to get things done. Did you hear me? To sit with him. To allow my soul to still. I have given this counsel out a dozen times in the last six weeks. And people say, man, I, I can't be still. I said, yes, you can. You won't be still. Those are two different things. Get a pen, get a piece of paper, and write out the Lord's Prayer. And do not get up until you do. And if it takes you seven times to start, then so be it. We have to learn, we have to learn how to be still and to know that he is God, to experience his presence. This has become invaluable for me. And I can tell you, the more pressure I feel, I, I love adrenaline, I love pace, I love moving forward, I love all those things. I have to discipline myself to slow myself down, to spend time with him. This began 20 years ago when I wake up on Sunday mornings and the number one thing, and I used, I, I used to be terrified of preaching every Sunday. I'm not as terrified anymore. Um, but it's been 22 years, so I got a little bit, you know, it's, it's still terrifying, but not as terrifying. And what you would want to do is to get up in the morning on Sundays. I would get up really early, sometimes 4.30, sometimes 5. I mean, just really early to get up and get ahead before I'd go walk on the beach and do all kinds of things um, to try to get myself ready. And what I always felt was I've got to get my message together. I got to look over my notes. And I was like, no, I got to spend time with God. And it just became a, a discipline to say I'm going to prioritize his presence over anything else that I have to do. Uh, that translates into my email. It translates into everything else that I do. And it's just taken a long time to this myself. And then the third thing, this is probably the most important. This may be worth, if you don't hear anything else today, you can write this down and go, okay, that was good. Prayer is not the way that we get God to do our will, but it is the way in which our will gets shaped by his. That is, is the hard part. So here we go. Luke chapter 22. Jesus came out and he went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. Luke chapter 22, verse 39. He came out, he went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. They had seen this before. And when he came to the place where he was going to pray, he says to them, look what he says, pray, why? That you may not enter into temptation. Other versions say, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw. <laughs> I don't know how far that was, just a little ways. And he prayed saying, I and mean, then here we have recorded Jesus' words. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. He's talking very specifically about the call to go to the cross. He's talking very specifically. There is something that he feels like God wants him to do that he doesn't want to do. This is hard for us to get our heads around. But I want you to kind of enter into this place and let yourself feel the emotion. If you've ever felt that, where you knew you were walking through something or going through something that you did not want, you did not, and you did not want it with every ounce of your being. And Jesus says to the Father, he presents his request to God, if there's any other way to do this, let's make that happen. Let's do this differently. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. And there appeared an angel from heaven strengthening him. Now, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that looked like in there. 
But what I think is interesting that when, when, when Jesus brings his request and he says, here it is, I don't, I don't want this, you, this should be done differently, there's something that happened that kind of settled him or strengthened him. And I think that's where you and I, oftentimes we get in this tug of war. Father, not my will, but yours. And then we don't, we've got to let his presence sort of sit on us. And look at what it goes on and says. And being in agony, he prayed even more earnestly. Like there was more to this. Oftentimes we just think it's this one short sentence. There was a wrestling. And then it's interesting that Luke, who's a physician, a doctor, uh, he's the only one who records this, this idea. He says, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. This was incredibly stressful. He was carrying something. He was laying this down at the feet of his father who already knows. And when he rose from the prayer, he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping for sorrow. This has been a long, rough week for the disciples. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of emotions, and they're just tired. And he says to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray. Pray what? That you may not enter into temptation. Now this is what, you know, so I get excited because I'm like, what is he saying? Like, I love the not my will, but yours. And then he tells the people who are following him, pray that you may not rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Let's walk and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Most of us, what, you, what we do, what, what we would do, what, what I would do, I'll project it on you, is when he says, pray that you may not enter into temptation, you have a list of the things that you're prone to fall into. Right? You got your list of things that you're likely to do wrong. And you go, I'm gonna try not to do those things. That's not, I don't think that's what he's talking about at all. There's something else at stake here. So you begin to look at this. What is the temptation that Jesus is asking his disciples not to fall into? What is the temptation that he just finished wrestling with? The temptation is to, when we don't get an answer that meets our expectation, to take over. When we can't see how God is going to pull something off, we take it over. We exercise our will over his. Does anybody else feel that? Like, you know what this is like. I mean, the Bible is full of stories where God did not act the way a human thought he should act. And so they took matters into their own hands and did it their way. I have done that yesterday. It happens. So what he's saying is pray, commune, listen, sense, see, so that you don't take over. You don't exercise your will. Stay after this. He says this twice. I think this has to do, the temptation is for you and for me to refuse to surrender our wills to him and instead just to trust and to act. Or perhaps refusing to even acknowledge that your will is different than his. Some of you, this is your struggle because you feel guilty or you feel like you're not a good Christian because what you want is different than what God wants. And you don't, you don't even acknowledge it. So you just stuff it and pretend that you really want what God wants, even though you don't. And what the whole point is this is, is bring it all to him. Bring it all to him. I think there's a real tendency for us to escape and to sort of get out from underneath the responsibility of what has been entrusted. And this is really where, frankly, I wrestle a lot. That what we've been called to and what oftentimes we're, we're, uh, we're facing will require for us to endure. So here's a couple of things I want to mention as we... Um, uh, kind of continue uh, through. I think a couple things worth noting is number one is Jesus' request was honest and it was pointed. The thing that I hope you will feel free doing is bringing your request to God. God, and, and with the emotion if you read the Psalms, how long, O oh Lord, are you going to ignore what is happening? That's in the Psalms. God, you know these people have been talking about me. Could you just like kill them all? That's a good verse in the Bible. But not my will, Lord, but yours. 
God, you know this thing inside of me, this desire? You know this. You know, everybody, everybody says it's cool and whatever, but, but, but I, I can't get a sense from you. God, can you, can, you, can you do this another way? God, you know what it is. You know. God, you know how dependent I am on control and all my money and the stockpile I've built and how much I depend on it and trust in it and it's become, whatever it might be. And God, you know these things. Bring them to him, pointed, honest, whatever it is that's happening. And then his request gives way. It gives way to something else that we see. And so I want to back up. I want to kind of walk you through this. This is going to kind of set up where we're going for the next few weeks. But oftentimes when we pray and we ask God for an answer, we sort of throw a request up and we sit back and we hope that he does something. What he instructs us to do in this particular scene is to rise and to pray that we don't cave in to failing to trust or failing to surrender or taking back our surrender, whatever you would use. And I began to think about this, and this is kind of where my, my, where my heart has been for the last several years. But in the beginning, right, God invited us to join him in ruling and reigning over what he had created. That's, that's what he did in the beginning. We, we are sort of commissioned as regents or you know, people with authority to actually um, act on his behalf. He gave us power as an expression of his image to contribute to what it is that he had created. We were entrusted with the power to create realities with the work of our hands. Some of you do this beautifully in your jobs and with the skill that you have and you create things and you offer things to the world that are beautiful. Uh, with our minds, the ideas that we have, and with our words, we get to create realities. We were given the opportunity to cultivate, creating space for things to grow and to become what God had intended them to become. These are beautiful pictures we were given in the beginning. And then the fall happened. Sin entered the world. And sin did not eliminate that power, but it perverted it. It twisted it. The power to create was no longer governed by God's love or God's good intention for human flourishing. Brother, it became a way for us to exercise our own will. Think about it. Isn't this why we usually want what we want so we can control our lives the way we want them to be controlled? And that sets all the expectations for what we see and believe and trust about God. And people even teach towards this. Oh, if you just tithe, you'll never struggle with money. If you just be faithful in this, you'll never do this. If you do this, you know, if you get your sort of sexuality under control in your kid, you'll never have problems in your marriage or whatever it might be. And there is no vending machine work to this. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wrestle because we have a will that has to be surrendered and submitted and brought underneath his good purposes. Once we do get our way, and just hear me out, our posture tends to be to create things that protect it. Don't let this change. And then sort of all bets are off from there. Um, I, I thought about this because oftentimes our prayers, and this is maybe for the next generation, but our prayer is no longer to bear the image of our creator, but rather we are working to manage the personal brand that we have created in the world. And these two things are just at odds. So this is where the prayer comes in. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right here, as it is, the way that you've intended it to be. What's interesting to me is that when we say your will be done here, what it means is that God has an intention 
in that moment. When you're about to lose your mind in your house because of what your husband did or your wife did or what your kids did, and that's a hard stretch for us to think, God has an intention in that moment. When you're making a decision about your business or about a relationship, God has an intention in those moments. They're not, they're not foreign to him. When you're trying to figure out where you're going to go to college or what kind of friends you're going to have in middle school or high school, God has an intention in those moments. We don't pray to get God to do our wills. We enter into this space to have our wills shaped by his. And we often don't realize that to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven comes with a price. Do you know what the price of his will is? It's ours. It's ours. What I have found, and I think Jesus modeled this, is that his prayer or his answer to our prayer is often found in our obedience. It's found in our willingness to follow and to do and to act on what he is asking us to do. Obedience isn't just about you proving to God how serious you are, but rather I believe that our obedience, I think the scriptures teach this, I think Jesus modeled this, that our obedience is the activity of God redeeming what God has actually intended. Think about how this changes a conversation. Think about how it changes a particular encounter. But this, but this all begins when we come to him and we are willing to submit ourselves to him. I know, and I know today, we are desperate for some of the answers that we've been praying for. I get it. I am. I'm desperate for people. We're gonna talk more about that later, but today, what I wanna remind you is that God, your Father, he knows what you need before you ask. He knows the fear that you feel in letting go of your will to embrace his. He knows. He knows that what we need is not just for things to work out the way we want, but rather he knows that we need to move through some things because he's shaping some things. He's doing some things that won't be done in any other way. He knows that what we need is not to be afraid and therefore conceal or hide, but these things need to be brought into the light so they can be shared and ultimately healed. He knows that what makes us afraid doesn't need to go away, but rather we need to find a sense of courage, a strength from him. He knows these things. He knows that we don't need things to just be easier, although wouldn't it be better if that were the case? But rather, we need the faith and the courage to do the hard things that are in front of us. He knows. He meets us with his presence. He meets us with his peace. He has the capacity to hold your heart, to hold it with whatever you're dealing with, and to shape our wills, and to open our eyes and to awaken the desires that we have been built for to come alive. So I want to invite you as we close our time to stand. Everybody, you can do that now. And we're going to pray this prayer together. And what I want you to do is I want you to recite the words. And this week, what will probably happen, hopefully, is that the phrase, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven will not roll off your tongue very quickly. You'll probably choke on the words. Thy kingdom come, thy will. (laughs) 
And that's the place, that's the place where you want to meet his presence. That's the place where our hearts actually get shaped and awakened to the life he intends for us to live. All right? So here we go. I think that's going to be on the screens. Perfect. Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And all of God's people who agree say, amen.